Hey there, welcome everybody. Today I am so excited because I have Jay Wilkinson here with me from Firespring. He is the founder of Firespring, a marketing firm uh, that works with companies and nonprofits that focus more on their why than their what. And today we are going to be talking about donor retention. So welcome, Jay. It's great to be here. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great, actually. It's, it's going to be a good summer. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I'm looking forward to summer, too. So um, today we're going to talk about donor retention. So why is this such a hot topic right now? What should we know about donor retention? Why is it such an issue? It, it, I think it's an issue because, just to be blunt, um, we in the nonprofit sector just don't do a good job with it. It's, not, it's, it's, uh, it's astounding to me that in the, in the for-profit world, you go, you think about your dry cleaner or any business that you frequent as a, as a consumer in, in the, in the, in the for-profit world, and retention rates of those businesses are 90, 95% and higher on a regular basis, nearly across all industries. Um, and it doesn't matter, even in industries where people are frustrated with their cell phone provider or whatever, you have these retention rates that are re, you know, really high. In the nonprofit world, you know, that uh, those of us that are out trying to change the world and, and make, make impact on the world around us, we're having just these abysmal retention rates that make it really difficult to retain any kind of momentum year to year. And we, I, I see like these donors coming on the front of the treadmill and we look over our shoulder and realize that half of them are flying off the back of the treadmill behind us and we don't really know how it's happening. It's just, it's an issue um, for nonprofit organizations because if we can figure it out, it would be transformative to our ability to build sustainable fundraising practices over time. Yeah, it's so true. So, I mean, what can, what can nonprofits do about it? And what can we learn from the business world? Why are they doing such a much better job than we are in our sector? You know, th there are a lot of reasons for it. And, 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 you know, of course, no one has the definitive answer. There's no guru sitting on a mountaintop somewhere, although there are people who are close. I would say... <laughs> You know, there, there are people, you are among them, um, are <laughs> people who are doing great work in and around the sector who, who are more educated and, and more informed about how to help this issue. Uh, but there's no magic solution other than um, we just have to be more intentional, more mindful of the practices that we deploy so that we're doing the right things. Um, I, I think one of the first steps or one of the first things is, you know, the fundraising effectiveness report that is out. And it, it's been coming out every year for about 10 years now. And about two months ago in April of 2018, the, the most recent report. And if you're not familiar with this report, this is something that comes out um, from uh, AFP and the Urban Institute or the primary sponsors. And what's really fascinating about this study yeah, and we'll, we'll put a link to it on, on the site in case people aren't familiar with it so they can find it easily. Thank uh, you so much for that, Amy. What, what, what I find fascinating about this, and, and you probably remember some of this too, 10 years ago, I was at an event, um, like the National Nonprofit Congress was doing some event where they brought in a bunch of people trying to really focus in on fundraising. And there was this room full of 500 people or so, and I remember asking the question, um, something along the lines of, how many of your donors that gave last year will give again this year? Um, what, yeah. what percentage do you think? And I asked people to kind of raise their hand if they know what their retention rate was. And maybe 10% of the hands in the room went up. Yeah, but that's consistent people, with what I find as well. Yeah. It's still, still the case. Yeah, but, we've, been, we've been talking about this for five or 10 years, and still yeah. only 10% of nonprofits probably know what their retention rate is, right? Yeah, and even when, when, you, when I dug in on it, back then it's still the same today, they guessed. You know, they didn't really know. They didn't have data. Yeah. And, and so as a researcher and somebody who's really fascinated with data and really knowing where we stand and, and how we got to where we are, um, those kind of studies were really, really um, something that I paid a lot of attention to. So when this study came out, it was the first time, to my knowledge, that anyone had ever gone inside out on the research. In other words, instead of just asking the fundraising professionals what they think their numbers are, right. they actually went into the software tools because at that point we were starting to get software up to the point where you could pull this kind of data out. And they looked and saw 
um, okay, the software is telling us this number of people gave last year compared to this number of people who gave again this year. And right. you could track and see which, which organizations were still um, had given again. And there's a lot of issues with it. You know, I, I hear people say all the time, well, it can't be that accurate because, you know, so, like, what if there's just a timing issue? You know, let's say I give a gift in December of 2016. Right. I don't give in all of 2017, but I give in January of 2018. And they're like 12 and a half months apart, but yet it counts as no donation, right? Or right. Right. soft credits where I might give in my name, um, in my personal name, and mm -hmm. then Next year, my wife writes the check out, and she uses a different last name than I do, so we're not credited to the same account. Right, okay. Those kind of things happen. Um, so there are lots of those kind of things, and so people look right. at that and say, well, you can't, you have to take it with a grain of salt. It may be not accurate, because when the software came out, um, when this AFP study came out, right. we learned that somewhere around 40 to 45% um, uh, of, of the nonprofits or I'm sorry, of the donors who were giving um, were retained every year. Um, mm -hmm. that, you, know, you flip that on its ear for the, for the attrition rate. We're losing donors uh, almost at the rate of six out of every 10. Um, right. Five to six out of every 10 donors are walking out the door every year. Yeah. And so that, that becomes um, a big question. That that's where the question is, is why. Right. And, and no one really knows except for there's a lot of trends we see, a lot of things that we see nonprofits where they make certain mistakes have much higher attrition rates and nonprofits that, that do these things well have much lower attrition rates. So that's what I think we should be focused on. All right. So let's get to that in a second. But how do, do you know how a nonprofit would figure out their retention rate um, if they don't know? Yeah, it's, it's a simple formula. You take the number of donors who gave in, let's just use 2016 to 2017 for yep. a specific example. The number of donors who gave in both 2017 and 2016, in other words, a donor gave both years, yep. divided by the number of those same donors where, where they gave in the previous year. So let's say there were 1,000 people who gave us money back in 2016, right. and 800 of them gave again in 2018. So it's a simple math where you take yeah. Both years divided by the number of the game in one. And so that example would be a 20% um, attrition rate, a 20% retention rate. Right. Um, we're 800 versus 1,000. So it's a very, it's a, one of the simplest equations there is in fundraising. You know, it's, yeah. it's so simple to get at. But the hard yeah. part is, is knowing who are those donors. Do you, have, do you keep good enough records to know yeah. and do you keep the soft credits that I was talking about so you know who's giving and who it's attributed to? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So go, um, you started to talk about trends and what to look for. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, th there are simple, simple things that people can do. And, and, and I know you talk about this in your work a lot. And it, it, it's as simple as being intentional about follow up. Um, and something that Adrian Sargent talks a lot about um, is the importance of of drip feeding performance data so that when someone becomes a donor, they go into a system of some sort and you're drip feeding over time um, about your successes and accomplishments. Um, yeah. There's a lot of talk around the nonprofit sector that, you know, it's stories over statistics. Stories are going to get at people's hearts. Um, feelings over facts, you know, which <laughs> I don't know that I agree with that, but <laughs> I understand the sentiment behind it because people connect with people yeah, uh, and and if there's if there's people behind an organization, I and I'll give you an example. I have a very good friend um, that has a child with Down syndrome, mm. and she has been part of an or, or I won't name the names of the organizations at the risk of hurting feelings of anyone, but mm. she was part of an organization that focuses on on you know helping people whose lives are affected by Down syndrome. Right. And we had a little bit disagreement of a personality with the person that ran the organization. She loved the, the philosophy, the support, but she didn't really jive with this person. Yeah. There was another organization over here that she'd never really heard of, didn't know a lot about, but they worked in and around the Down syndrome world. And she decided to shift all of her focus and attention and volunteer time and donations over to this other organization. Okay. Not because of the mission or the purpose of the organization, but she didn't align with the person. Right. We have to remember that um, people have relationships with people. Yeah, we yeah. Hear all the time, people don't give to nonprofits; they give through nonprofits. So we know that. Yeah. And the storytelling 
and the relationships that become everything. And as a nonprofit development professional, or if I'm on the leadership team of a nonprofit and I'm in any way responsible or involved in helping elevate the fundraising efforts of that organization, yeah. I'm doing everything I can to drip feed that performance data, to connect with people often. Yeah. The thing Dr. Sargent talks about. Yeah, I, th I think it is about making sure that people understand what you're doing, the impact you're having, and how their money was used, mm -hmm. um, and feeling appreciated as donors. So oh, I think that, that that is part of the connection with the, the leadership of your organization. It's part of the, um, the drip campaign that you're talking about is making sure that they feel like they're an active, ongoing participant. Um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about before we started this official conversation um, was more along the lines of what you do at Firespring with websites. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, website plays a big role, I'm sure, in donor retention and, and attracting that donor for the first time. So why don't you talk a little bit about the role that the a website, a nonprofit's website plays, um, both in terms of attracting new donors and retaining them. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about both, and I think it's, thank you for that question because it's so important. Your website as a nonprofit is the core center of your brand. It's the center of your marketing universe, and we know um, through Nonprofit Hub has done a study <clears throat> and learned that 82% of people who give money to a nonprofit say that they will go to that nonprofit's website to check yeah. them out before be, before they'll consummate that donation. So it's yeah. really important. Um, so the website has to tell the story of the organization in a quick, you know, easy, compelling way. Uh, a lot of times we get caught up when we think as a, as a nonprofit, well, we gotta have the latest and greatest design. So we design our websites, it's called a parallax design where there's a one graphic that flows down the screen and then it's, it like flows into the next graphic and then that flows into the next and mm -hmm. it looks beautiful, it's fantastic, but we get so caught up in the trends and the design standards, we think that's what we should be focused on. When in reality, a well-designed website for a nonprofit and everything that we've learned and uncovered, we've had more than a thousand end users, donors in focus groups over the last couple of years. Yeah. And we've asked the question, if you're going to give money or if you're going to, if you're on the board and you're going to support this organization, if you're going to volunteer yeah. for this, whatever your capacity in that connection, what does the nonprofit need to do with their web presence that will compel you to engage, donate, whatever it is? And what we hear all the time is that, number one, when they come to the website, they need to get it. They need to understand quickly. Yeah. So we have our mission statement hidden away somewhere on a page, and then we have some you know, beautiful design, it's because we hire people with great intentions that don't really know. And we all, every nonprofit has somebody that, uh, that I refer to them affectionately as their go-to geek, right? So, um, these are the people that help with technology, the person with the highest tech IQ that they lean on for help, mm -hmm. input, advice. Every nonprofit has one. Some are lucky enough to have a full-time paid person where they can have someone on staff. Most right. aren't. Yeah. Most of not a board member or maybe the eighth grade um, son of the board member, you know, who's really good with computers. <laughs> right. Um, we all have a go-to geek in the nonprofit sector. Um, and again, I mean that with affection, not with any disdain. I, I've been that go-to geek in many organizations. Um, yeah. We lean on that person and we're, we're, we're somewhat then reliant on whatever level of acumen expertise they have. And most of them, come from a background, not all, this is, I'm just, I'm talking in generalities here, but um, yeah. the vast majority we find don't have specific experience in how to build a nonprofit website in a way that pulls that prospective donor in, captures yeah. their attention quickly, and, and in, in a microsecond helps them understand who this organization is and what they're about. Um, yes, yeah, so if, if you were to give three, two or three pieces of advice to nonprofits go-to geeks about simple things that they could do effectively to change the, the you know, immediate impression, right, when somebody lands on their homepage what, what, or, or, or anywhere on their website, what are the three pieces of advice that you would give to somebody's local 
local yeah. geek. <laughs> so what, we've learned, what we've learned from our research and from the focus groups we've done is having a simple, a simple place when you land on the page, a photograph and a headline, a headline that tells the story of the organization so that in, a, in an instant, I get it. I know who they are and what they're about. Okay. Um, sometimes we have these rotating banners that like will fly in and out of websites and they might be really cool photos, but there's no headline or statement that, that, that gives context to what this organization is about. So the number one thing, the moment someone lands on a website, it's mm -hmm. very simple actually. There should be a photograph and a headline that tells the story, that instantly gives me insight as to who this organization is and what they're about. Okay. You know, they just stop long enough to think about, okay, what would that mean? It's not that difficult for most of us to come up with that. It's okay. not an entire mission statement. That's too many words most of the time. Yeah. It's not just a photograph with no words because it's, it can be interpreted so many different ways. Okay. Of an image and a headline with maybe a subheadline or a, a, a kind of a statement that tells me the story of who this organization is. Good. That is well, far the most important thing. All right, good. What's one more? So the other thing that we learned... And this is something that most nonprofits, and I'm, and th this is going to cascade to the part of the conversation where we're talking about donor retention. Okay. I'm going to share a, a trick on a website that we have seen. I've, I've, we've tracked thousands of nonprofit websites. So we have the fortunate circumstance of being like seen under the hood. So we know mm -hmm. how people interact with websites. And yeah. I've never seen what I'm about to share with, with you. I've never seen it employed or, or put into practice when it hasn't had a double digit or more increase in return visitors to the website in terms wow. of repeat visitors, okay. which has a major impact on, on retention of donors. Great. And it, we, we, call it, we call it website vitality, and it's a simple formula. There are three parts to it. Part one is you have dated content on the front page of the website. So that means you have a headline with uh -huh. a date next to it. So my brain knows that, you know, okay, this is the headline, this is a date, it's, to, it's today's mm -hmm. date or whatever. Part two, the headlines and the dates that are listed on the website should never be more than seven days apart to the next headline that lists. So in other words, you're posting something once a week and you should show the third part is show three occurrences. So because my brain, well, and this is really weird, but our brains work in such a way that if we see three headlines, with three dates next to them on the front page of the website, I don't have to click on a blog to get to it. It's on the front page. But when I click on one, it's going to take me into the blog. Uh -huh. because vitality rating. Every single time we've employed that technology or put it into a website, we see the repeat visitors of that organization just skyrocket over the course of the next six months. Fascinating. It does, it's like playing, it's like the Jedi mind trick. You can tie your website right up to date. Yes. You know, and, and, yeah. and so my brain now tells me that everything here is always evolving and changing and, um, and it's such a simple tactic that and it's so basic, but yet it's profound in the impact that it makes. Yeah. I, I mean, those are so tangible, so practical, and so simple. I mean, honestly, to me, the root and heart of all fundraising is as simple as this. It's just a question of how to break it down and make it simple. So, yeah, yeah. you know, a headline with a picture, and then three posts with dates. I mean, how simple is that? Great. Um, what, one last one? Or do you want to go back to donor retention? Sure, I, 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 can, I can do one last one. Um, and so what we've learned also, the number one thing that someone wants to do when they go to a nonprofit's website, we've learned, again, this from focus group research, the most likely thing, yeah. uh, if it's the type of nonprofit that has events happen throughout the year, the number right. one action is not to make a donation, um, sadly. It's not to... Um, um, to learn more about a white paper. It's not to um, all the other things we think about that we could have people take action on. The number one action that people want to do when they go to a nonprofit is sign up for their event. Um, th th so we've learned that over the years. That if, So if it's a nonprofit that has events, not everyone does, mm -hmm. but a lot of those that actively are doing fundraising do. They have more than one typically event throughout the year. Yeah. So make your event registration page remarkably simple and easy to use. And the biggest advice I can give you is do not build your event registration page um, with a PDF file that I have to download. This is what we, we see about 60% of the time on nonprofit websites. 
I go to the registration, it's a PDF file. I can print it out, fill it out manually, scan it on my scanner, send it back via email. That's online frustration, it's not online registration. I and see. We, yeah. so it, it breaks hearts for people to hear that because not so many nonprofits have done that. Right. It builds your registration form in such a way that I can go to it, fill out the basic information, yeah. submit my payment, hit um, send, and I'm done. I shouldn't yeah. have to do all the manual stuff. Yeah, so to me, that's that's just being up to date with technology, honestly, um, which, of course, we know so many nonprofits are not. But, all right, good. Let's wrap it up with back to donor retention. Any final thoughts on uh, on donor retention? You know, um, my, my biggest... My biggest thought on donor retention is we have to be inten intentional and we have to be proactive. Those are the two words that resonate in my brain more than anything else when I think about what it takes to be the kind of organization that, that does a great job. Be intentional yeah. and be proactive. And so what that means to me is that I'm intentional about sending out thank you notes to everybody. I mean, I know we, we get tired. I know you and I probably get tired of saying this over and over, but we know that more than half of nonprofits don't send a thank you note when someone gives a donation. Um, we know because of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising tactics where people are now raising money, you know, like I'm, I'm gonna walk in the walk for whatever, will you, will you sponsor me for $100? People oftentimes make a donation and don't even know that they're making a donation to XYZ organization. All they know is I'm supporting Amy. Yeah. Um, and so that's becoming an issue. There are people that don't even know who they're donating to. Um, so we have to connect with those donors um, and the number one way to do that without question is to make sure that we're sending those thank you notes and it just sounds so basic. Yeah. But, and, I get, and again, we get tired of saying this, but more than half of nonprofits don't send thank you notes and I'll never understand that. Yeah, you know, it's also so simple. I know, easier said than done, but to make a thank you call. I mean, yes. that has been shown time and time again to have significant impact. And just think about how often you as a donor have received a thank you call. And the reality is probably not very often. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you said be intentional about your donor retention, the first thing I thought you were going to say, which we talked about earlier, was know your donor retention rate. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's the place to start because if you don't know if it's going up or down or if it's good or bad um, or where you are, it does, you know, it almost doesn't matter. So um, we're going to manage what we measure. So let's measure the right things and make sure we're focused on it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I think we've had a great conversation. I so appreciate your time and, and those excellent tips. I mean, really, I think there's some pretty straightforward, uh, basic things that nonprofits can do. And I know that um, our viewers will be so appreciative. So thank you so much uh, you, for being you. here. And I'll, I'll just point out that um, on the topic we were talking about on, on websites, we ha I have a session, a webinar online that I conduct uh, once a month. And it's okay. free. It's all education. We're not banging people over the head saying, hey, buy our stuff. <laughs> it's, it's all educational. Um, and it, it's, it's just called How to Captivate and Engage Constituents with Your Website, where I will go into those five principles and give tactics specifically how to do that. Perfect. And they can at firespring.org. All just right. Well, if you have a link to the sign-up page, we'll include it below. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, people, or at a minimum to your website, but we'll, we'll definitely include a link if we can to that that monthly webinar. That sounds great. Well, thank you for being a resource and I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Amy. Take care. Thanks, Jay.